Jamaica. Hello, St. James, young people. How are you? Good. We want to say hello to all our viewers across Jamaica and all our viewers across the world on OneSpotMedia.com. My name is Empress Golding, and I am the creator and project director for today's very special hashtag Youth for Chat broadcast. And we always say, talk up youth, Miss Effie. I think we are ready. Today is all about advocacy. Hashtag advocacy, we say. What we say? Talk Up Youth, as a part of uh, continuing its work in youth development in Jamaica, has rolled out for the very first time a new project called Youth Empowerment Through Dialogue, funded by the United Nations Democracy Fund. We are here advocating for workable solutions in our communities, and we are giving young people ages 14 to 24 an opportunity to advocate for the issues affecting their them or advocate to find solutions to the problems in their community and we encourage them to demand accountability from their elected officials, local, national representatives who have been elected to serve them. So are you ready to be empowered young people? Today we are coming to you live from St. James and this is the first of 14 town halls across the parishes. The aim of the workshop was to increase their knowledge of constitutional rights and political governance, increase knowledge on methods of holding elected officials accountable, build their capacity in youth advocacy and develop an advocacy priority agenda for the parish. So young people, youth for what? All right, so for the very first time, in Jamaica, it's a youth empowerment through dialogue. Now, we invited all of the MPs from St. James, other ministers of government, and councillors. And we asked them to introduce themselves to you and tell you what their responsibility is in serving you. And then we're going to get to the questions and throw it to our very special host on the floor in just a second, Giovanni Dennis. So let's start over here. My name is Tishura Gibbs. I'm the director for JPS for Western Jamaica. My job every single day is to provide energy solutions for every single one of my 224,000 customers across Western Jamaica. Looking forward to a great afternoon with you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, youth. Part of my responsibility in presiding over this city is to make it a very clean, a very workable, and a very safe city to traverse. And today I'm very happy that um, Talk Up Youth can see St. James to start the, the project that you're now on. Because I heard you said 14 other constituencies. But I'm here to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. My name is Heroy Clark. I'm your member of parliament for St. James Central. We started our campaign on four pillars. And that those are early childhood education, earn and learn situation, small business development, and community orientation and infrastructure building. So far, we have been doing great with what little there is, but we continue to dialogue with youngsters within the constituency and to find how best that we will be able to at least help you to achieve your goals. Good evening, everybody. My name is Ashley Ann Foster. I am the chairman for the People's National Party in St. James Central and a National Executive Council member for the party. My job is to ensure that throughout the parish, we have an effective opposition. I am very inspired having spoken to some of you and I look forward to assisting you and working with you. And now, you're going to ask a question, so I throw it to the floor to my co-host, a journalist, and another young man on a mission to use media as a tool for true advocacy, Giovanni Dennis. Thank you so much, Empress. Uh, the heart of this project, um, as, as you've been mentioning, is to strengthen the capacity of the youth um, in St. James, not just in St. James, but in Jamaica. And so we want to do just that without wasting much more time at all and just go straight to them. And so the first question we have from the audience here is one of our youth advocates who has been trained uh, by Talk Up Youth in St. James um, yesterday, long process. So he is very well prepared. And he is O'Neill Salmon. 
and he has a question to his uh, member of parliament, Hiroi Clark. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Oni Saman. I'm living in Central St. James. I'm advocating for employment for our youths in St. James. Our main problem is that whenever we apply for jobs and organization call, the first thing they ask for is, do you have any experience? If you don't get experience, who is going to help us to start? And where do we go for our help? Ever since time, we have heard this argument of, you know, you're, you're not experienced enough. That is something that should be thrown out the window because unless somebody is prepared to give youngsters a chance, then there is no chance. One, what we have been doing over a period of time is that those persons who are not as qualified as they are supposed to be for a job, we have certain groups and programs to assist with your development. We have the center of excellence, one. That will train you. It is heart, NTA, run and operated now. You go there, there is a trade, there is a program, even in the BPO section, there is. And therefore, once you have done the program and you are certified, then you are able now to take that certification to any organization and to get a job, one. Two, we also have the CAP program, which I have inherited from the previous member of parliament, which is something that is very good, and I have advanced on that situation. What we are crying out for is for youngsters to make good, make use of the opportunities that are given. That again is also aligned to heart, and heart will certify you at the end of your training. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, Giovanni, I think we'll give him a chance to give his, his suggestions. suggestions. Indeed, indeed, indeed. And indeed. we'll be right back. Do you believe the youth of Jamaica are involved in the governance of the country enough? Well, I wouldn't say they are involved enough, and I just want to clarify that when we talk about youth, we talk about um, ages 15 to 29. Um, many students, certainly prior to age 18, really don't take active interest in politics and the governance of our country. As they become adults, they take on uh, greater interest. How do you suggest they get involved from that level and begin to advocate for workable solutions there? As you mentioned, there are several options. You know, a lot of persons who eventually um, get involved in politics operate within their parishes, within their communities. So I, I, I would encourage you, the first thing they need to begin to do is look at opportunity within their churches, within their, their immediate community to see how they can get involved in the leadership of those communities. It is from building that kind of base that eventually that they can um, aspire and move up the ranks to, um, you know, to get involved in broader uh, parish and national institutions. Talk of youth, Mr. Fett, talk of youth. So welcome back to our hashtag Youth for Chat Town Hall meeting. We're at the Montego Bay Cultural Center here with our special guest, the youth of St. James and their elected representatives. They're seeking answers from them because they want to know how they can better be involved in the governance of their country and about issues that really and truly are affecting them. And so we have several youth from the parish of St. James here. They've been asking questions. We're just going to go to a follow up quickly um, from O'Neill Salmon, who asked a question of his MP, Hero Clark. So O'Neill, you can just follow up with your suggestion. All right, thanks. Um, I'm 
I'm clear that there are things put in place for youngsters in Montego Bay, but I have some suggestions that I was saying that even youths that are qualified are not able to get any jobs. So I was saying that you could use some of the CDF funds to better the training at the institutions, the qualification and internship, or you could put some measure in place to say to the organization that, look here, you have to employ at least 10 youths for the year or give them a chance to get some experience somehow and probation or something of that sort. Thank you very much, Mr. Salmon, once again. Uh, just to let you know that we work closely with the different ministries that are able to assist. And for this summer, starting sometime in May, we are trying as best as possible to place as many tertiary students in workplace to get that experience that you speak about so much. And also, at the end of June, to look at some of the high, the high school student just the same. I, I understand exactly what you're saying. I was once a part of that grouping some time ago, not so long. And I do share your, your, your burden somewhat. What I would say to you, my office is located at 9 to 11 Churchill Avenue, Montego Bay number two post office. The number is 821-9352. It is equipped with a liaison person, a secretary, and other personnel who will, at any time that you call during the hours of 10 a.m. and 5 p.m., will direct you or assist you as best as possible. Is there anybody else from uh, MP Clark's constituency here? Is this the first? All right. Is there anybody here that's never met him before? Well, sir... Later on, you're going to have a one-on-one -on -one with each of them. So here's Def the first time. Definitely. But I also mm -hmm. want them as best as possible because you understand the workload that you have to be here in Montego Bay and in Kingston. So therefore, if you are unable to reach me at 363-8895, then the office number is 821 9 to 11 Churchill Avenue. Um, beside me, we have Tedra Stewart, and she has a question uh, to Ms. Gibbs from the Chamber of Commerce. Now, as the person who is currently vying for the president of the Chamber of Commerce, um, what measures do you believe can be implemented to encourage business owners to be more flexible with their employees who are, at, who are students, and as well as to guarantee more part-time job creation for tertiary level students? Thank you for that question. So th I think we can all agree as business leaders that our human capital is one of our greatest assets. Mm -hmm. And then we can also agree that we have some of the brightest minds or a pool of the brightest minds right here in Montego Bay. The reality is it's not something that we can do alone. It has to be a collaborative approach. And so while the chamber can certainly lead it, it has to be in collaboration with the university with forward planning in place. What value proposition are we putting to businesses? when we're saying to them, we want you to employ students. And we have to make sure that our students are actually preparing for jobs that exist. So at the end of the day, we're matching you with jobs that you have a passion for, because companies will not be, be inclined to take on people just for the take of taking on people. We want to make sure that you're adding value to the business. On the flip side, we also must acknowledge that it impacts the bottom line of the business, adding additional heads. And we want to make sure that there's great value in adding additional heads to any organization. The other thing as it relates to part-time employment, and I can speak for JPS, where we do have a system in place for part-time and for our, st our student employees to go to school. But we also want to see a balance in that approach. So there has to be flexibility, not just on the part of the business, but on the part of the student. So when we allow you extra hours in the evening or early time off to go to school, to do your exams, to study, we want to see that same flexibility that you can say to us, if we have a deadline to meet as an organization, you are willing to work that extra hour or that extra two hours to make sure we deliver on our timeline. And I'd just like to follow up to, to the question that was posed earlier 
Um, we talk about not being able to, to get jobs because of lack of experience. But what I've noticed a lot of times, it's not the lack of experience, it's really how you show up and the passion that you have. Because there seems to be this mentality sometimes that somebody owes us something, that, and, and that really shouldn't be the case. I met with a group of students and I was talking about social media and their personal brand. And in preparation for that presentation, I asked for a list of some of the students who would attend, and I went and I searched their social media pages. And I would say to you, young ladies and gentlemen, go back and clean up those social media pages. Because when you come to us for a job interview, the first thing we do is go look at what you're doing in the social media platform. And I had a young man in my group who, on his page about three years ago, I love vodka and rum. I leaving work going straight to the rum bar. I'm hearing voices in my head. Now I see that. I am not even going to interview you. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Gibbs. Um, I, I, we do take the point that Ms. Gibbs is making, a very important point indeed, or images that we project on, on social media and what they convey of us personally. Will any employer want to take us? But we have to go to our other question from Aimani Hitchman to Mayor Homer Davis. Um, I'm from Central St. James, specifically the community of Cornell Court, which is one of the largest government housing developments in St. James. My question is to Mayor Omar Davis. My concern regards infrastructure development on the two new housing schemes adjoining our community and how their development adversely affects us, such as sewage and debris. What are your plans to address or, or alleviate these issues facing our, our community? I know a project was done some time ago, and to the best of my knowledge, when I spoke with the Water Commission who manages that system, that system is working satisfactorily. As it relates to things that happens in your community, a great part of it has to do with how the owners of properties in Cornwall courts really treat their old surroundings. For example, we have had reports on a daily basis where individuals who are doing extension to their houses normally deposit their building material in the roads, which cause another problem for the people who traverse those streets. And as citizens, and I, you know, I appreciate you, Mr. Hitchman, you know, putting those things forward, because as citizens and as young people, we need to take some responsibility as it relates to our environment. Because a number of things are happening around us which is not correct. And what we will see happen is in the long run, then you will see all the problems begin to happen in terms of over flooding, in terms of streets being damaged because instead of the water takes the drain, it takes the road. So that is some... And Cornwall Court is one area that we have police over and over. Our municipal police have served summonses, they have served notices, like on a daily basis. It's one of the housing schemes in St. James that we have gotten the most complaints from. So the citizens themselves have a responsibility. But as the municipal corporation, Ed, we are prepared to work with the citizen and to enforce the law as it is on the books right now. We have to throw for a break. Thank you, Mayor. But I have to ask you, I might, do you know how to find the mayor if you need or when the mayor has meetings? We'll take a break. He'll let you know in the break. And when we come back, we're going to hear for, uh, from our caretaker, uh, Ashley Ann Foster, as she will respond to a question from one of our young people here from St. James. Make sure you get the mayor link and know how to find him and win him of meeting. You understand? Talk up, youth, Miss Effie. We'll be right back. Youth for chat. definitely need more young people involved in the political, social, 
economic life of the country in every respect. In order to get their views heard, I think they have to make direct representation, not just to their political representatives, whether they are elected and in the parliament or whether they are just representing one of the major parties, but they also need to advocate with other civic organizations for their views and their positions, whether it is whether they have views in relation to employment issues, issues concerning crime or expanded educational opportunity or otherwise in their communities. So they need to link with civic organizations and of course they can summon community meetings with, the, with older citizens or just among themselves and make their views heard through the media. This is a time for active Activism on the part of young people. All right, so we've heard notes from the Honorable Rural Reed, Minister of Youth, Education and Information. We also heard from the leader of the opposition, uh, uh, Dr. Peter Phillips, coming in there. And now we are live in St. James with the young people. Young people, are you ready to make a difference in your country? All right, because yesterday at our Talk Up Youth workshop, just a reminder that 34 young people from all the constituencies across St. James had a chance to sit with facilitators from the National Integrity Action, like Professor Rosalie Hamilton, who engaged and enlightened and educated on the role of the MPs, the role of ministers of government, right? We also were able to look at what is a constituency development fund and how were you empowered, whoever was there? All right, now we're gonna throw some questions out to everybody here if we get a chance during this broadcast and after, but I'm gonna throw it to the floor, hashtag youth for chat, where one of our young persons will ask a question to one of our representatives here on the stage among the beautiful young people of St. James, Giovanni. Yeah, and I have with me now Sylvester, and he has a question for the PNP caretaker, um, Ashley Ann Foster. Go ahead, Sylvester. Yes, a pleasant afternoon, um, Ashley Ann Foster. A pleasant afternoon, fellow um, youth and the media, etc. Now, uh, my name is Sylvester Gilvey, and um, my question is, I, I heard there are lobbying about um, students leaving university trying to get jobs, but what about the students who are leaving with um, an entrepreneurial mindset rather than um, finding a job, creating a job. Um, what platform you have in place for those set who are willing to take that risk to assist with the development of this city? Okay, wonderful. Interestingly, when I came in, I was sitting to my left having a similar conversation with the young man in the blue shirt right there, entrepreneurship. How are we going to find avenues for our young people who are so minded to go out on their own to create their own business? Now, we live in a country with a balance of payments problem. We don't necessarily have the funds to facilitate the amount of loans that we would like to give as a people and possibly as a government to entrepreneurs. So as a young person myself, I would say we have to start creating our own opportunities. As I said over here, you're not going to start, none of us, in the job that we want. But to get where we want to go to, we have to have discipline and sacrifice. So we start in a low-level job, and we work and we save. That seed, you start a business that can generate, this is while you're working, you know, that can generate funds to start a larger business and a larger business. If you look at the Forbes list, the majority of persons as entrepreneurs on that list never started with wealth. They created wealth. So we have to condition ourselves. We have to now move from in here and inculcate a culture of entrepreneurship. It is hard, but we can get there. We have to start empowering ourselves through avenues like this coming together to achieve this dream of entrepreneurship. I think that we have a good co-op society. We can go there. We need to work together. 
So it's not ideal, but we have to do it on our own. Okay. Yes, the government can create opportunities, but the opportunity, if it is up to me, that is the only way. My name is Fitzsir Randall. Um, sir, um, I recently did some research online on youth unemployment rate in Jamaica, and what I found out was that the, re the last quarter report submitted, it was 27.4%, and we are ranked 14 in the world and the most unemployed youth. So I'm saying, what, do, what measures do you have in place to help fix that and help employ our youths and prevent them from you know, doing illegal activities such as scamming, which is becoming the norm these days? Well, it's, it's, very, it's very sad for you to say as a country that scamming becomes or is becoming the norm these days for our young people. But youth employment, in my opinion, starts from you yourself. I know that the government and its agencies has a lot of areas in which they prepare youth for employment. They have the Art Trust NTA, they have the Youth Service, and they have our schools in general. But employment, and let me say this to young people, and I will go back to what um, that gentleman said. You, all of us here as young people, we won't be able to be employed, but we can create opportunities for ourselves. And I would encourage the young people to look at areas in which they, they have a passion for and aim towards those areas. Because even though there will be jobs available over the next 18, 24 months that has been talked about the BPO sectors and the tourism sector, that in and itself can't absorb all the young people who need a job. So my encouragement to young people is to look in other areas in which you have a passion for. And we have farming, we have tradesmen, because in Jamaica now, every tailor is over 50 years old. Every plumber, likewise. Every carpenter. Importantly, importantly, Mayor, you mentioned something that, you know, the youth um, make themselves employable. That, that's essentially what you were saying. Yes, yes. And um, I also heard the representatives from, from, representatives, sorry, from the Chamber of Commerce saying, you know, it's a lot of the image that the youth project on social media and, and this affects their employability. And while we all agree with that, that the image that they project is important, uh, all of you here as representatives, one of the things that I want to put to you is are we creating avenues that are training the youth about about how they should project themselves on social media. Because it's okay to say, okay, don't do this and don't do that. But what about do this instead and do that? So it becomes more of a positive, this is the way to go, as opposed to not, 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 not. So that's a suggestion that I would like for you, for you to, um, to think about. We have another question from an uh, advocate on the stage, and Empress will, 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 will direct that question. Her name is Dominique, and Dominique has a question that, you know, all the young people yesterday were charged to create questions from the knowledge that they um, received from Professor Rosalie Hamilton and Renee Johnson and all of the other facilitators. So we're going to throw it to Dominique to ask her question. Good afternoon, everyone. As was said, my name is Dominique Stone and use for chat. My question is for Mayor Homer Davis and Minister Chang, who was invited and confirmed he was coming, however, has not shown up. All right. I am cognizant that there may be social housing facilities provided for women going through abuse, young people, victims of mental health, um, and the disabled. However, what is being done to raise awareness about the facilities and activities for safe housing for these people as well as improving these facilities? Minister. As it relates to um, persons of unsound mind, I am now in dialogue with Kumi 
who normally spirit that aspect of um, those persons. And there's a, we own a property up at Brandon Hill that is being used as a, as a calling center for persons who, you know, fall on hard times. We have the open art round on Orange Street. I'm not saying it is enough, but as a municipality, we are extending our reach as it relates to um, those persons of, of unsound mind and persons who abuse females. Yeah. Right? I, we don't have a system in place to deal with abuse, but I know there are other organizations that deals with that, which sometimes we as a municipal corporation assisted in that process. However, all right, we understand that there are these facilities, but how do these abused females, how do they know about these things? How are they aware that there is some way there's somewhere that you can go, there's a safe haven. Um, we're here to protect you, we're here to provide for you while in your time of distress or in your time of need. How are they made aware of these facilities? Well, abuse normally comes to the attention of the police. Mm. And the police will in turn direct them to these centers. I think what we're hearing is that, and Giovanni mentioned it earlier, we have an issue with communication. Yeah. We have an issue of really identifying whose responsibility it is to disseminate this, in, in, this information. Is it the organization? Is it the member of parliament? Is it the mayor? Is it the caretaker? We need to know, and you young people are for ask the questions and get the answers in, during this broadcast and after. So we'll be right back as we go to a break. to you from the Cultural Center in Sam Sharp Square in Montego Bay, St. James. We've been feeling questions um, to the elected representatives here, both in business and in parliament, and the youth um, really and truly have put the questions to them, and they have more to put to them, and they want to get in as much as possible. Dialogue will continue after the broadcast. So remember, you can participate on all the social media platforms. It's um, at Talk Up Youth, and the hashtag is Youth for Chat. Our next question comes from Sherry Slate, and she's directly it to her member of parliament, uh, Hiroi Clark. Go ahead, Sherry. Uh, Mr. Clark, my question is directed to tertiary education costs. And do you know that every year the cost of education it goes up and not everyone is able to say get a scholarship or even a student loan. And you know, we people want to want a chance to hire the education. So what can be done or what is in place to allow more persons to gain access to higher education? Okay, let me, let me say this to, to us. It is for us to seek information. It is rightly so that times gone by, it used to be very difficult. I can attest that today, going forward, that 
student loan is going to be a lot easier to access. The funding, the money that is put in into the Bureau has been increased so a lot more students can access and the process is even more, even more easier to be done. So it is for us now to go out and make sure that we get a part of the pie. And please, don't wait until August 22, 23 that you're going to apply to get it for September. Apply now so that everything can follow in, in sequence to make sure that come September you have student loan to go forward. All right, thank you so much, MP. Unfortunately, we're out of time for the television broadcast, but the conversation is going to continue right now live on our Talk Up Youth Facebook pages at T-A-L-K-U-P-Y-O-U-T. -E we do have some special people to thank. However, we did get two messages coming in. Three, one from the Honorable Mrs. Malahu Fort, Attorney General and Member of Parliament for West Central St. James, who said that the rain held her up and she's unable to make it. Dr. Horace Chang, after hearing your call, sent a message and said he was late because of the rain, but he is on his way, so he's going to come and meet you after this broadcast and also the Honorable Pernell Charles Jr., Minister of State and the Ministry of National Security, who also confirmed was stuck in Mandeville and is apparently on a chopper on his way. So, oh, Minister Chang is here. Clap him. He made it. You see what Mr. youth Chang, advocacy come, does? Come, come. Youth advocacy does this, you know? <laughs> come. Youth advocacy yes, does this. he's here. So, we're going to continue the conversation live with Member of Parliament for Northwest St. James, Minister Chang. Dr. Chang, is, whose MP is he? Do you know? Some young people say they don't know who their MP is. So, sir, we're going to ask you to, yes, in the back, just to introduce yourself, tell us what your role is in the world of government and who do you represent? Thank you. Good evening. My apologies for being late. We're on the constants for the morning, but I represent Northwest St. James. For those that hear that, merely means Anshore, Flanka. Uh, Providence, Norwood, um, the left hand side of South Spring going up, part of Floyd Hill, and um, Glendevon. That's about the, the, the width of the constituency. And uh, as a member of parliament, of course, I respond to represent the entire area. Uh, although the primary responsibility of the member of parliament is really to design legislation that creates a framework for a society that is both for economic growth and for justice. But in our own situation, the question of the infrastructure and the opportunities in the constituents is critical, which means keeping your roads, um, water supply, utilities generally, and of course, providing opportunities for young people, yes, in particular those who are maybe economically impaired and are doing well in high school and need to go down for further education, offering them both opportunities as well as assistance in going forward. That's part of the responsibility of the Member of Parliament. At the national level, I am in the Ministry of a new ministry, which we created recently called Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation. The concept of the ministry is to pull together what is termed regulatory and infrastructure agencies in government so we can coordinate what should happen in terms of the development of the country. So while you're building houses, running water supply and wastewater collection system and roads, it should be coordinated with the Environmental Protection Agency and the Planning Institute that they fit into a cohesive plan rather than just happening. That is essentially the role of the ministry and eventually said we'll create the institution that will provide that. Currently, the ministers have to do most of the legwork to ensure that they are coordinated and they can proceed with some kind of cohesiveness and successfully. Right. Uh, Minister of Economic Growth, uh, Dominic had a question for you earlier, and I just want her to re-ask that question so you can also provide that answer for her, given that you're here now. 
Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. So the question was asked that I am cognizant that there may be social housing facilities provided for young women going through abuse, young people, victims of mental health, and the disabled. However, what is being done to raise awareness about the facilities and activities for safe housing of these persons as well as improving these facilities? Well, in terms of awareness, it is normally done through the social agencies, like Child Development Agency, when they meet individuals who are in families that are having challenges, the Ministry of Labor and Social Security, and less directly the Ministry of Housing, but oftentimes we are asked to investigate on a personal basis cases that are reported. Sometimes we pick it up from newspaper, sometimes just individuals writing in, and once we investigate and they meet the criteria, we just take steps to correct that. Sylvester, we'll give you here. All right, we're well, on the topic of economic growth. Um, let's discuss particularly um, marijuana. Now, there's been a lot of talks in the media about marijuana and lobbying about marijuana in terms of um, pharmaceutical and possible export and um, economic growth. Now, you spoke about the legwork. Um, what are the specifics in terms of legwork where the economic growth is concerned, particularly with marijuana? Let me go back and say, because my comments may not be as popular as the others. It's, it is a popular topic, and I think you use the right term, popular. I don't know if it's a realistic topic to discuss in terms of economic growth. And I just pause it to point out that I think I was the first elected person to call for decriminalization for small quantity of ganja. Back in 19, the record was about 1980, no, in fact, 1977, when I wrote a speech for Hugh Lawson Shearer. And I still maintain that there's a rule that it ought to be decriminalized because from a social point of view, the arrest of dozens of young men with us owns a spiff is not partially not part of the social order. And it creates maybe more challenges for crime than it, it, it solves. But on the other hand, in terms of the open industry on guns, I think it's grossly oversold. And I mean in, in fact it shouldn't be sold at all, but that it, at the point it's very popular. It's not appropriate people to be hanging on to it. No more reasons. First of all, if you're going to create an industry, you have to legalize it fully. Right now, it's legalized for medicinal only. And uh, there are many chances with that, as the Ministry of Health reported to you. Ganja does have psychedelic effect, and in its, its, in its not natural form, there are individuals who can, in which we can unmask psychosis. Anybody who sees unmask psychosis will understand that that is not something that always happen in, in one case. I've seen it on more, more than one occasion. It has other side effects, like any kind of drug activity, and many medicinal drugs have serious side effects. Aspirin have about 46 side effects, but the unmasking of psychotic is maybe the worst as side effect of ganja, because that means people go literally psychotic and will kill. On the other hand, from an economic point of view, they, this idea that there's a big, huge industry behind ganja, the, the products that they're talking about are well known. And there they established asthma soil, which treats asthma, was in fact developed by one of our local scientists. It is a good product. It does not bring it any more than other asthmatic products. Right? You know, it, it is a bronchodilator when used. And as a young physician out in the country, I tell a patient, if you don't have the Ventolin, and you soak some ganja and take a small amount with, in, in white rum, it will solve your asthma problem. But it's not something that's going to go out there and become a major product that will challenge the established comes of Sanders and Pfizer in, in it. And if the product proves valuable, you need laboratory facilities that we don't have to extract in its purest form, which will not benefit the farmer in Jamaica, they're going to synthesize it, market it, and pat patent it and market it to make millions. The same thing applied to Canasol, which hasn't gone most places. The one product that seemed to have the potential to be a major contributor to the pharmaceutical industry um, is what is now used to treat epilepsy in the CBD program. The chances are, if it's identified as a superior product, and I, do, and I think in case it does have superior qualities to established anti-epileptic products, one of the big companies is going to extract it, test it, which takes some time and expense, patent it, and sell it. And that when I come to Jamaica. To develop a patented product now, you're talking in the region of 500 million US to get it humanly tested past the FDA um, criteria. Using as a 
supplement, which is what the products you have around, the CBD products soaked in some extract or boiled as a tea and so forth. That's different. That will never be a major industry. It will be part of your folklore, and those who understand it are using it, and nothing wrong with that. I have no problem with it, and that's why it should be decriminalized. Ms. Foster, do you have a quick response to that? I also have a question from the floor for you, but I just want to know if you have um, a response to sure, um, Minister yeah. Chang's position. Yeah, Go ahead. Your mic is ready. Okay, I, I disagree wholeheartedly. I think that there are a lot of economic... When you look at the United States of America and the Canadian markets, it, marijuana can be a major vehicle for growth, especially medicinally. I'm not sure of how many of you have been keeping up with CNN, and you saw, I believe, I can't remember whose program it was, but they were on CNN, and the effect that marijuana had with regard to tempering epilepsy, especially in children, is phenomenal. So as we speak, Minister, I'm sure you're aware, there are persons here even today from overseas looking at extracting marijuana from Canada predominantly and some from the United States. And your government has issued licenses with regard to, that, that's nonsense, Minister? Nonsense? All right. So I don't understand the science. Well, this, this young people shows the disconnect between the politicians of old and afore with the times of today because we cannot see developing markets in other countries and deny ourselves as a small nation the opportunity to capitalize on something which is innate to Jamaica. I think what we're hearing now, I, you, you have one, one more response from that, Dr. Chan. Remember, Just I do emphasize. have a question for Ms. Foster. I said the, the potential impact in epilepsy is very good. I said that in the very beginning of my presentation. So I repeat, cannasol, asthma sol has been around a long time. Nothing new about them. The potential for the anti epileptic drug to work is there. It's not going to be successful. It's not going to be Jamaica. Going to be. It's going to be extracted in its purest yes. form by some laboratory in the developed societies, yes. patented and sold yes. as a drug like others were done. Remember, you know? And you, 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 Uncle you, Vin you, came out of Periwinkle. I know that, that can discussion no cannot be completed here and now Agreed. because obviously you both have di di different what? views. We have a question now. We have to move on. I think the, 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 the good... The good thing, though, Gio, to yes. cut you, is that what we need now is the young people now of St. James to call this meeting, put together an advocacy agenda as to what you want within that world of marijuana and economic growth, and how do we deliver it to you, Dr. Chang? How do we send, how do the young people give you their ideas or their economic growth via marijuana plan that you can then read through in your discussion um, and policy development? And How can they send you their ideas? No, they can, there's a marijuana authority, but let me repeat. My first call for decriminalization, my social point was not yet today or yesterday, was 1976, 77. So I've been familiar with the topic a long time since I was in medical school looking at the use of marijuana. But there's a greater risk socially the increased incidence of abuse by youngsters that identify the ministry of it. a serious problem. That's something we take lightly. And the fact is, if any of you take it and have a hereditary history of possible mental disorder in the family, which you could proceed to life normally and do very well, but it happens to unmask psychosis, your life is done. That's it. So I think it is really something that needs to be educating that people will understand to look in their own family history understand what we can do, do the required checks. It is well established, it's not guesswork, it's not something that happened. And the same thing can happen to any number of individuals. We have to follow so up there on is, that. There is something that you must, you must understand when you start talking about this so loosely, that this great industry. We, we have to is follow up, problem? Minister, but we do have a lot of other questions that, that that person from the floor want to ask. And my question to you, sir, is, what measures are being implemented within your constituency to limit the political division that exists amongst the residents post-election period, as it can be argued that this contributes tremendously towards the retardation of development within these communities? 
I find this uh, one of those dogmatic questions that we ask us all the time. I don't know if, there's a, if you talk about the constancy, there's, you'd have to identify the constancy part of our country where political divisions separate the people. There are significant social issues and social divisions and those we're dealing with on a different level. But I don't find, I mean, remind me of where you have in the political division in the conscience that people don't cross borders because of politics. I mean, if you take, where we have had a recent flare-up of violence, flank as an area of my conscience, where had a history of some violence. Um, nobody from top flanker doesn't go to bottom flanker because of politics. And I walk through the, both areas alone and with everybody. Um, if you come to Norwood, I can't think of a place that has had any political problems. So the issue of political and partisan post-election is genuine, but I don't, it's not one that relates to my constituency as far as I'm aware. If anybody have any other ideas, let me know. But we, I can't think of any other place in the constituency I can refer to. In, in, in Glen Devon, Bottom, Penn, Hendon, these two districts that they work together as one community. We have never had a problem. You have violence between different elements of the criminal on the world which there is some place to place because of who control which turf and which turf. Oftentimes they have to do, well, they don't have to do the politics. Because most times they end up in an argument with that I walk both sides. So I think it, it's a topic that is to be discussed. The country has come a long way in terms of political partisanship from when I started back in the 70s when the ideological divide separated societies, split families and split communities. And there are still some sections of the corporate here that have elements of political divide, which themselves are becoming more social than political, but there is an element of political divide in the corporate area. It doesn't exist elsewhere, and part of that you have is to begin to, the kind of development that is blind to what is happening, um, in the sense that if you go to these areas, there tend to be poverty stricken. Most of the people living there have no tenure to their residence. In fact, there are many areas of the Western Belt, including South St. Andrew, West Kingston, and uh, other areas where the country tend not to understand. They, they're developing the old days on the Ministry of Housing, and nobody will have titles for the property. Now, yes, once you title somebody, their character change, and Mini that kind of thing will make them. One of the things, we just want to be very clear in our communication. I saw the person who asked the question behind you. She made her face up several times. Is he answering your question directly? We want to make sure we're communicating clearly. Are you, are you satisfied with that answer? Because you, for I am actually not satisfied, but in the yes, interest of I time, we'll that. continue the discussion after. Immediately afterwards, just want to follow up, Minister. No, well, in terms of answering, you have to tell me where it is. I went off that tangent because I right. don't find it relevant to my constituency. Okay. <laughs> Well, 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 remember, you're more than just a, a, an MP for our constituency. You're also a, a minister. But we have two quick questions from the floor. Uh, those we can get back to immediately following um, the, the conclusion of this official form of the town hall. But I have a question from Olivia, but first one from Shanil, who wants to ask a very important question. Shanil, go ahead. Um, I read in the Constitution where it states that um, it's the MP's responsibility to ensure the transparency of the Constitution Development Fund. However, I, I don't, I'm not sure if that is being done. So I would like to know, how is that information being disseminated or is it being disseminated at all? And to what dimension? Because in the Constitution, it states that it should be, um, it, um, it should be given to a wide cross-section of the constituency. Thank you. First of all, I suspect there is no kind of... The budget is published and it is known that every member of parliament have access to a certain amount of money that you call the Constituent Development Fund, which in wide budget term is a conditional cash transfer in that it is dedicated in equal amounts to every constituency. There is normally a community meeting inviting NGO organizations to discuss your budget. Those who are involved in that, in that kind of community organization would know, but like many community organizations in practice, they are not very representative of society. In fact, the, the real irony of the whole thing is that the widest cross-section of people that can be pulled together can be pulled together by the member of parliament, which would be his political supporters. If I invite my workers to a meeting, I get 300 people. But the reality today in Jamaica is that outside of the church, the only national body you have out there, despite of what a lot of NGOs will say, is the political parties. Nobody else can put in this room, fill this room with 500 people at short notice except the political party. 
unless there's a crisis happening that people are awakened and emotionally charged and run out for it. That's just a fact of life. I see but both, we do have the meeting and we do promote it. I see Mr. Clark and Ms. Foster itching to, to say something to, to add to add quick, to quickly to this. Um, Ms. Foster, quickly, let, let me just involve you in it. Do you have something to add um, to, 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 to this issue? I think that um, as young people, it really comes back down to being aware of how the system works and participating. So I know that members of parliament are supposed to have CDF consultations. So call for your consultation, okay. group together, meet with your MP, and you have a right to do so. So I think it really comes back to that. That is my short answer. Does everybody know what a caretaker's responsibility is? Is there anybody that doesn't know all of the duties and responses? Put your hands up, let's see. Who doesn't know the responsibility of a caretaker? Okay, so we're gonna ask Ms. Foster to enlighten us. What is your role and responsibility as caretaker? Well, as a, for the, the, Central St. James. The role of a caretaker um, is not constitutional. This is not defined per se. It would be defined by your party. So, Whatever the mandate of the party is, you're to carry that out organizationally. And in terms of, I think, as a chairman for a constituency, because the People's National Party doesn't have caretakers actually within our structure, we have chairmen. So as a chairman, you try as much as possible to connect and to ensure that as if we are in opposition, that we are effective. And we are with the change of guard within the party, about to get back on the road to carry out those duties as a team. So can we just ask, what do you do? Like, no, I'm, what I'm trying to do, I, it, did, did, did you, are, you, are you happy with the answer? We're kind of trying to, I think the thing is, what's been happening, what's been happening is the young people really well, don't know yeah, and what thing, it is. I think important to impress from that answer. Hold a second. I don't, just, just, just to be very frank um, with you, Ms. Foster here. Yes. A lot of persons um, listening to and I can just imagine another person saying, boy, it just sounds like a duty. It's just to get the votes in the meantime while in opposition and get the votes. So we're in win opposition. The Absolutely. We're in opposition. No, but, but what do you do Absolutely. to help Absolutely. So vote? we are to advocate. If, if we, there's something that we don't like, we are to advocate for it. We are to connect. We are to organize. We are not elected. We are in opposition. So our aim, every political party's aim, Dr. Chan, correct me if I'm wrong, and everybody else on the platform, is to become government. How do you became, become government? By advocating for the needs of the people, because as a politician, you must be an advocate for the people. Uh, with respect, Ms. Foster, I have to strongly disagree, and I can hear the youth here. Do you agree disagree. or disagree with that position? Yeah. Do you agree or disagree with that position? Yeah. And I can almost say why, because in opposition, it do, it can, you can still organize programs and plans and seek yes, sponsorship and support me, for those you, programs. So the answer you're giving, I believe, is absolutely. almost unsatisfactory. But there is, when you're in opposition, we try as best as we can to do that, but you have to understand that funding, it doesn't come to you quickly. So yes, you can take what you have out of your pocket. You can try to arrange Our fundraisers and sponsorship. But we have it, a question, though, from, 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 an, position. from an audience member itching to say something. Sure, it's Olivia sure. um, Shaw. She has it's been wanting to ask you a question for the it's longest while. But I do believe she may want to make a comment and then ask her a question. Go ahead, Olivia. Good afternoon, everyone. As a youth leader in Mount Salem, I most strongly disagree with your job description because if you're going to come to Mount Salem on the basis of just telling us what you can do if you're the government, then I don't want you but necessarily. We, but then you don't have the resources. There's a big difference between being in government. Mm -hmm. There's a difference in resources. All right. So but, I have to go to work every morning at 9 to 5 because I have to live. Okay. Every other person in, in opposition has to live and provide for their families. So while we may want 
to, to act as if we are in government and put programs in place. It is just not economically and physically possible. So, so what you can is, what do, do you expect? Uh, but because, another yeah, thing is if, that I think mm -hmm. Mr. Horace Chang, That's Dr. Horace right. Chang had stated that only political leaders and churches can fill a room with that, 500 that is people. As well. Then you can come and say, Mount Salem, we're doing a fundraiser because you need this program and it can happen. Boy. That's very, I, I think, I think as a young politician, mm -hmm. you come in with this idealistic mentality. When I came into politics at 17 years old, I was on with Dr. Chang, correct, and I was an idealist. Having become involved, especially as a young woman, it is not easy. And think, the things that you think operate, it, how you think things operate, it is totally different. And reality hits you, and reality hurts. And this is showing what we need to we need to dig Dialogue. in. We need to have more of these conversations so that the young people can yeah. understand. And I see our another member of parliament is itching to respond. So we're going to ask you to join. Let's Thank continue on this. Thank so we need to identify, Thank understand the roles. Thank you very much, Empress. One of the things that I find lacking, even though you are together now as a group, as an organization. I don't see the same thing from you, the youngsters, within your community. How many times have your name is? Olivia Shaw. How many times have Miss Shaw been to the Citizen Association or the CDC meeting? All the time. But and I, you can check with the president of that that I am present all the time. But, I, but, but, I, but I, have been, I have been invited, I have been there. I have and you have never met me? I was awarded from SDC for Woman of Worth. I am very active. I am, I am, I'm very happy to hear that. I'm very happy to hear that. I'm very happy to hear that because I have contributed many a times to those functions. What I am saying is that the youngsters, even though Miss Shaw has been to her citizen association, we are not still seeing a great volume of youngsters. Miss Stone, your mother works at the St. James Municipal Corporation. Miss Stone is a member of the Cornwall Court, it's supposed to be the, the youth group. You are a member of the youth group? Fine. Mr. Hitchman is also a member of the Cornwall Court community. We want greater interaction from the youngsters to say to us that this is where we think we can make a contribution. How can you partner with us? But if we are not getting that from you, then we are going to believe that you're okay. And the only way for us to know that you're not okay is for you to say to us, I am not okay. There are many programs in the Cornwall Court Citizen Association. Miss Barnes at the Mount Salem CDC is very active. We need to see more youngsters getting involved to take up responsibility, to act as mediators, to act as interventors, to act as organizers for the community. And if you are going to sit by, if you are going to sit by and say, okay, I know me happen to, so many business, then soon and very soon, it is going to come to your door. What is it that you're going to do when it gets to your door? Let us group together now. Let us group together now and work so that it don't get to our neighbor's door. Because, guess what? Next after our neighbor's door is our doorway. All right, let me step right in here, Mr. Clark. I, I, I don't think it's a case that they don't want to get involved and they're saying, you know, it doesn't concern them. I believe, though, the issue is that they don't have a platform or they don't think they have enough of a platform to do that and they don't know that there is one, which is why we are here today to begin that dialogue and to begin that process where they can indeed express their views. I think that's the issue. And even in how you respond to him, just, 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 just to help, one of the things I noted is that it's almost like saying what we are seeing is and what you need to do is. But what it should sound more like is, 
we are going to do this to empower right. you to advocate right. better. And I think that is the direction that we need to go. Right. That is the direction indeed that um, Empress is envisions and, and, and that's what we're doing. We're starting that dialogue and it's important that you um, take the, the onus is on you, especially those who have been trained here today to ensure you continue the advocacy, continue the dialogue. I was whispering to Empress just now that boy, the, the town hall really just heat up and the meat of the matter just coming out at the end of the broadcast. But it is important that we get the issues out there, we get the issues aired. All right? Um, but importantly, Empress, where do we go from here in terms of communication? Because there's clearly a disconnect with the youth who are in the constituency and the elected representatives here, and also our business persons as, as Thank well. Thank you, Gio. Our Chamber of Commerce, we're going to go along the line and just ask you all to make a commitment right now to the young people of St. James as to how you're going to continue the dialogue so that you can assist them to become more empowered so that they, the most important asset of this nation, will be able to lead so when you are all old they will be the ones looking after you you with me so we ask you to start here just kind of your final word of commitment to the young people to continue the dialogue how do they get in touch and how do you continue to assist in their youth empowerment in st james Thank you very much, Empress. And I think one of the biggest commitments I can make to you today is to lobby the other businesses in Montego Bay. I, I represent JPS, but I think our businesses are changing. The way we do businesses are changing. And what we're seeing is that a lot of you go to school for a job that may no longer exist. So what we will do and what I'll commit to is making sure we're coming out into the schools more to let you know the evolutions taking place within our different organizations, what's been made redundant and what's coming forward. So there's a whole industry around IT? Are you looking at applications? Are you looking at virtual reality? Are you looking, I mean, so, so we need to look at these things. We'll talk about the energy sector. Are we just focusing on engineering or are we looking at renewable energy and integration? Are we talking about smart grid? So we want to make sure we're educating you and I'm committing to making sure we bring that platform to you so you know where the job market is going so you can choose educational paths that will take you to jobs that do exist so when you leave, you're not fighting for entry-level jobs that everybody's going after. Thank you so much, Mr. Gibbs. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Clapper, 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 clapper. Uh, quickly, Mr. Mayor. On. Well, I'm glad for this opportunity, and I'm glad to see how the youths of St. James really come out to be a part of this event. But as the mayor of the city, we have an office on Union Street, and we are open to have discussion with young people who have projects, who is a part of youth clubs, who are part of community-based organizations. Matter of fact, I can tell you that at our monthly meeting, our monthly meeting of the St. James Municipal Corporation is every second Thursday, and the public is welcome, and the young people are welcome to be at our meeting. So you can get in touch with us at the Parish Council, 952-5500, just ask to speak with the mayor's nine secretary, five, two, and she will nine, give you all the information. Now, my own personal number is 301-5500, 301-5500, and we so can much, continue the discussion. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Clark. Thank you very much. I, there is a song that says, I believe the children are the future. I am convinced that the youths are the future, and therefore it is my commitment today that I am reaching out to you. I, I am asking you to just stretch your hand out. Let me hold hand and work as best as possible. My contact number is 363-8895. The office number is 821-9352. The address is 9 to 11 Churchill Avenue. And if you're a walking, it is a road that runs parallel to Barnett Street behind consumer supermarket upstairs. I'm saying to us, I would have loved if you had invited CSJ, CSJP and PMI because there is also a program for youngsters who are involved in their community, giving back to their community. CSJP will hold your hand where your tuition fees are concerned. Check them out. And that's something that we can indeed follow up on. So that's why you need to contact him so I can put it on to CSJP, all right? Uh, Minister Chang. Thank you. Um, it's a very, 
I find the question a very powerful question and what I'd like to comment on. And I know you're running in time and I don't want to take too much of your time. So I've heard everybody speak and each person has given a very sensitive and profound statement and advocating to the youth to participate or to provide opportunity involved. Maybe because I'm old, I have to give you a little bit more of a, what I like to call a practical approach. And we have a real challenge, so I don't want to be dismissive. And I could either say that I've gone through the whole process from participation, being a student leader in high school to university, into politics, and ultimately in the government, and seeing the participation, and participated all the way. But the country has a real problem in terms of offering participation for young people. You have my numbers, and I'll tell you, one of the problems, I, you know, the, my colleagues ever give you the telephone number, that's very good. And I just pause and give you a little division of it that you'll find that is, if you have, have the experience that is, it doesn't work that way. I'll tell you why. In my first, my campaign, I was elected, I gave out 5,000 business cards. And everybody had my number, and I had my problem, they called me. I ultimately changed it, you know, on a very practical note, I used to get, does the calls from prison. Got everybody at the constant, my, my number. And they were quite innocent calls. But the commissioner of police called me one day and said, look, Dr. Stark, do you know that you can be charged with being an accomplice to crimes? And because one of the person that called me at that time was the most wanted man in Jamaica. And there are others who were called from jail. The things that have been outlined to you are practical things that are important in the entire institutional structure that you have access to MP. But the country has a deeper problem. Pre-independence, independence, everybody in the country had a mission, an objective, an ideology. We wanted independence, and we wanted to build Jamaica, and we participated openly. A sixth form in the early 60s felt you could change the world. Not just Horace Chang and a few in Cowan College. We felt that if we got involved, we could change the world and make things idealistic. We're an independent country, new, vibrant, confident, about to solve the nation's problem. The reality is that things have changed dramatically, some of them for good, but a lot some for, for the worse in one Mr. context. Chang, I'm getting the wrap-up signal, but okay. and, and you, you, you mentioned uh, several times the idealistic nature of what they have. And you're saying you're a pragmatic person. Right, so Tell them pragmatically, the, the youth What we need to urging, do as a country, we have to begin as leaders and at your level to discuss the future of Jamaica and what we see can unite us as one people that you begin to redevelop a mission. Because when you leave here, your struggle is to find the fee to go to university. Your struggle is to begin when you to take the student loan, find the, the job to pay the student loan. To tell you then to find 20 hours a week to participate, you don't have the time. The political process, for example, all political parties are voluntary organizations. They don't have any response we talk about, and it is because you have a mission and a purpose you want to achieve through that political party. You join the party, give your time and effort. All that has changed because we have not seen that happening. And I think one of the things that the young, bright minds to explore is what will be Jamaica's mission and purpose. And whether you have one or two ideas, but we can discuss them practically, organize as a country behind it, and move towards it. Social media have given opportunity now, and I don't even talk about that. The Prime Minister, who is a social media person, have about 200,000 people on his Facebook page. Dr. Chang. But we have a mission we need to unite behind, and we have not clearly defined as a country. And that's where we need to help. Final word to you, Ms. Foster, from our panelists. Oh, OK, great. Well, I'm the only youth in politics on this stage today. I am 28 years old. I've been a member of the People's National Party for five years, actively. If it is up, if it is going to be, it is up to me. Beverly Manley taught me that. If you want to see change and you want to be a part of the change and shape your own country, you have to get up and carve out a space for yourself. I'm a member of the People's National Party and I'm playing a role in the political process, which is extremely difficult, especially if you are a woman, because I want a better Jamaica. And yes, all I can do right now is advocate for the change that I wish to see because it is a voluntary organization. So I'm encouraging you all to be the change you want to see. When people tell you to, to stop, you have to go. And you can realize all of the ambitions that you have, not only for yourself, but for Jamaica. All right, thank you.
Thank you so much, Ashley. So this is just the beginning. And this is where, whether you're a JLP, PMP, CCC, OBC, AFG, Jamaica comes first. And this is where the dialogue begins. So continue it, young people. We charge you to do that. Before you leave, take a picture with your representatives. Hashtag Y-O-U-T-F-I-C-H-T. Dr. Chang, if you're not on social media, we're going to get you on. And we're going to post you all out there today. So we're going to keep the conversation happening in the social media spaces and all across the island. Giovanni, thank you. Clap yourselves for being amazing. And remember, importantly, follow up. See, so all of them there and them there and them sitting in front of you, they are serving you. It's not no isolated, nobody else or no else. It's you they must serve. Hold them accountable. Every single one of them. All right? You can promise me that? Yes. Okay. And, and enough it. respect and be informed because a lot of times we want to hold them accountable and we want to beg things. But as you heard up there, we're not play with part. We're not empowered and informed with information and knowledge. So get informed. Have the conversation with manners and respect and know say we are one people. Talk up you, Miss Effie. Talk up you. Thank you. Oh, do I get the final word? Quick. Good, good, good. You see, all I know there, so the whole I know a champion. I want to start the process. So turn to the person beside you, even up here as well, and just say, big up yourself. Give thanks. You're for chat.